This reading is from Rays of the Same Light by Swami Kriyananda and is entitled, What is an Avatar? This passage is from the Bhagavad Gita, the fourth chapter. Unborn, changeless, Lord of Creator, Lord of creation and controller of my cosmic nature, though I am, yet entering nature I am dressed in the cosmic mar- garment of my own maya or delusion. O Bharata, whenever virtue declines and vice predominates, I incarnate on earth, taking visible form, I come to destroy evil and reestablish virtue. God may be said to incarnate, in a sense, through any great soul who, while living on earth, abides solely in his consciousness. The degree of his manifestation would depend on the depth of that saint's spiritual realization. Certainly, there would have to be some measure of direct inner perception, as opposed to living merely in the constant thought of God, some revelation on God's part of his ecstatic presence within. In India, the concept of divine incarnation is traditionally applied not so much to to those who in this life succeed in realizing God, as to those masters who have been born with that realization. Many in India, therefore, believe that an incarnation of God must be a special creation of the Lord's manifested uniquely by him to dwell among men for a time in order to grant salvation to all who believe in him. Paramahansa Yogananda, however, explained the nature of a divine incarnation rather not as a special creation of gods, but as the return to earth of a soul that previously strove to find God and become emancipated in him. A special creation of gods would be less in a position to give people faith in their own spiritual capabilities. People need an example with which they can identify personally. That is the whole point of a divine incarnation. Much of the benefit of such an incarnation would be lost if God had to create a perfect human being simply because no actual human being could ever be found to fit the role. The obvious way, surely, to guide and inspire humanity would be to work through some qualified member of the human race, one who could inspire others with faith in their own potential for achievement. For a person to grow in virtue, it is necessary for him to feel inspired from within. If he depends too heavily for his salvation on some outward channel, no matter how divine that channel, he will never develop the inner strength of character required for progress in the spiritual life. Rather, he may find instead just the excuse that human nature always seeks to persist in its human weaknesses. He may even condemn as presumptuous any effort on the part of others to grow in sanctity. Spiritual progress is not for cowards and weaklings. It requires great inner strength. That is why the Bible in John says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The good news is that power is given to those who tune in humbly to the infinite divine source. But it is given from within and is always commensurate to man's own receptivity. Paramahansa Yogananda explained the stages of spiritual development thus, A master who has so merged his consciousness in God as to be always awake in him, having shed all vestiges of personal ego, is known as a jivan mukta, one freed while living. Such a saint lives outwardly as a normal human being, but he is no longer limited spiritually, forever freed from earthly desires. His only reality is the infinite Lord. Such a soul, however, at first still carries the vestigial memories of his past deeds, committed when he's still wedded to ego consciousness. These memories, too, must be spiritualized gradually, their karmic threads unraveled, the mental image of each of them transformed into divine awareness. God's presence must be realized in even the most worldly memories, For although the ego sees itself as separate from God, God, in truth, is everywhere. 
The most criminal behavior merely casts a veil, albeit a thick one, over the indwelling divine reality. The enlightened master, freed from the bondage of delusion, must align his old self with that present realization. Once freedom is attained from past actions as well, a state rarely achieved on this material level of, of existence, the soul becomes a paramukta, or fully liberated soul. When such a soul is reborn on earth, he comes as a full divine incarnation, or purna and avatar. God's power radiates through him in a way that it cannot through any lesser being, however enlightened. Even a fully liberated master, a paramukta, can uplift to the divine light only a limited number of disciples, but a divine incarnation can draw to God as many as come to him for help. Thus, through Bhagavad Gita, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Well, happy almost Krishna Jayanti, and again our celebration of Krishna and Babaji as we were saying that this has been part of an ongoing uh, celebration from our Kriya initiation yesterday to our, our satsang today and then of course our celebration tomorrow on the actual day. It's really a joy when we take time out of our lives uh, to focus on and honor and love the uh, the great incarnations of God that have come to this earth and come into our lives. It's particularly lovely when we're in uh, a country, for example, where where all people or many people are celebrating uh, or uh, offering respect to that incarnation of God. And so, of course, it's thrilling to be in India, really on all holidays, because <laughs> even, even uh, it reminds me of um, what I wanted to say, is even if uh, an incarnation of God is not for one's own personal religion, still there is a great respect for that soul as an incarnation of God. I re it, was, it reminds me of my uh, cousins uh, when Darmini and I visited Chennai uh, before we moved here, before we lived here, or no, maybe it was when we first arrived. Um, uh, we had said that uh, we would like to visit uh, St. Thomas Mount and uh, because that was where uh, St. Thomas was and uh, or had been and also the, the San Tome, the St. Thomas Cathedral. And they said, but, but Thomas, you know, why would you want to go there? And we said, well, St. Thomas was one of the uh, apostles. And they, they said, is, what does that mean? We said he was uh, a direct disciple of uh, Jesus Christ. And they said, oh. And they said, well, we will go. And it was so dear to me because it wasn't their path, but out of great respect of how Jesus had come to this earth and helped so many, if this was a direct disciple of his just down the street, then you know, of course we would go uh, with respect and reverence. And so it, it's really beautiful that way to honor God in all forms and uh, in all true manifestations. So we have to come back to then this concept of avatar and uh, what the incarnations of God come for. It, first of all, Swamiji makes clear, as Master emphasized, that an incarnation of God is not a special creation, sort of like as if God goes to the closet and takes some magic clay and makes it look like a person and then says, now you are perfect and now go and tell the other people that they should be perfect too. Well, how does that help? And as Swamiji said, it even would be somewhat demoralizing to say that the only way you can get a perfect human being is if you make one from scratch, <laughs> perfect from the beginning. It's sort of, well, then what hope is there for any of us? A master said, no, 
uh, a special incarnation of God could only come to earth in order to be worshipped and would serve no purpose uh, in terms of actually helping people. That it is a soul who has already gone through this, the same challenges that we all have and has been liberated from that, then comes back to inspire us. As Jesus said, to, so that you can overcome even as I overcame. And, um, and Krishna has said, I, you know, I incarnate again and again. You know, many lives I have lived. I know them all. And he says to Arjuna, you do not know all your lives. So we have to remember that though it's beautiful to offer our reverence, our gratitude to Krishna, to Babaji, to the masters for all that they have given us and the whole world really. And how, again, it's so beautiful how people come together in their shared love of the same manifestation of God, incarnation of God still. The, the highest way, or one of the highest ways we can express that love is by following his teachings, following his example, doing what he taught. That, I mean, is, don't we feel sort of uh, honored when we give a piece of advice to someone that they have asked for and then they follow it and they say it helps? It's not that we're honored because we're such a great teacher. It's rather they do us the compliment of uh, receiving some advice and, and being helped by it. If you see a physician helping somebody and then they're cured, it's a thrill to see that that person was able to free themselves with help from suffering. And that's what the masters come here to do. They say, you know what, you're having a bit of a hard time and you need not. I can show you the way out. They're not coming to show themselves off. I mean, just imagine uh, as if when a, a parent is trying to teach the child to walk. I mean, here it is, the parent can stand on two feet and walk effortlessly around, and the child is still crawling. Well, does the parent walk in circles around the child to say, see my stride, observe how I can walk? No, they say, listen, here's the little thing with the wheels and maybe you can practice st strengthening your legs and holding the hands and practicing like this and so on <laughs> until finally they too can walk. And that's all the masters are really coming to do. They're helping us to learn how to walk, walk on clouds. Maybe they, a better way is to say they're teaching us how to fly, which maybe for us seems just as out of reach as walking does to a baby. That, listen, you have the ability to travel. Just follow me, do what I taught. Meditate, for example you'll get there because it's who you are. I mean, just imagine, to change the image, uh, a, a butterfly or a bird perfectly capable of flying, just walking around all the time. Sometimes you see that with birds, that when they're uh, looking for uh, food, let's, without giving it a name, uh, on the ground, <laughs> living food, they, you see them walking and hopping all around, and it's sometimes strange to see them walking for too long, because you sort of wonder, but couldn't you just fly over there? Do you need to walk to travel? Why bother when you have those wonderful wings? And again, that's what the masters are saying to us. You can do it. It's who you are. They say, I was just the same. And so now that I have escaped, I want to help you all to escape. Really, it's a prison. I sometimes wonder if the masters are all gathered in Hiranyaloka or wherever they are, and they sort of say, who wants to go visit the prison colony on Earth? It's not a prison colony on Earth. The whole planet is a prison colony. And uh, as they, maybe they draw straws, and who knows, and then, you know, Krishna says, that's all right, I'll go. And he goes. And he comes to say, come get out of this jail of life, as Master said. But the jail is not really imposed externally, that we are being prevented. I mean, yes, on one level it is because of Maya, but again, leaving that aside, the jail is really internal. It's a jail that we create only by our attachment it's, it's funny, it's as if the, uh, the prison door, the jail cell door is unlocked and we are holding on to the bars. <laughs> and all we have to do is let go of the bars and the 
door will swing open. But it takes a little bit of doing to uh, let go of those bars only because, as Sri Yukteswar said, we are hypnotized by our own experiences and we can't see past them. And so how do we learn how to see past them? How do we break the hypnosis? How do we break the dream? How do we discover our wings? By, first of all, looking to one who has already achieved it and realizing that their example and their active interest and help for us is what can inspire us to believe that it's possible for us too. It's not a desire to become great in the eyes of the world like the great incarnations are. It does the world credit if it holds its incarnations of God to be great, but it is not the world that, the, that, that determines their value. Their value is determined by their closeness to God. And so, and I should say that each of us ultimately has that value, for our soul is perfect and it is a part of God. And that is actually who we really are. We think we may be this person, this lifetime, this PAN card, this passport, this Aadhaar number. But, you know, past life, passport, next life, Aadhaar, who knows, who cares? You see, those are all just fleeting. And so to tune in to our soul, to tune in to our true um, purity, our true divine nature. You know, we do this all the time. When we meditate, when we pray, sure. But even before you even came to the spiritual path, who knows? Sometimes you may have encountered a teaching that said, for example, that all people are limited. This exists in every religion, that people are essentially impure and that if they come near enough to God, he may be so good as to clean them off a little bit. That people are by default sinners, they're by default wrong and only through great uh, blessings can they become worthy enough. There may be a part of you, there certainly was a part of me that rejected that philosophy, that said it's not true. It's not because I had some better philosophy to turn to. It's not because I had any experience of God. In fact, I didn't even believe in God. I didn't disbelieve in God either. I just sort of left it as one of the unknowables. But something in my heart said, no, I don't think that's true. You see, each of us has, especially as we grow in uh, experience in life, has this sense of there's more to me than this, and there's more to this reality than I've experienced, and the truth is higher, more beautiful, and more thrilling than just day-to-day, -day, you know, living, and even, uh, even a limited vision of reality, as I was just describing. It's not satisfying to my heart. I know somehow that there must be more, and that is... Uh, deep within us, as Swamiji and Master have both said, a truth cannot be learned or a truth cannot be taught. It can only be recognized. There's something within us that recognizes, yes, that is true. There's something in us that resonates, that gives us that, um, that attraction to, yes, that's, that's what I feel, that's what must be true. We read Autobiography of a Yogi, for example, and it's, it's amazing to say, wow, this is what I sort of believed, but w so much more than I ever knew possible, but something in me tells me that it's all true. And even better, uh, inspires me to follow that. That's what Swamiji said of Master's books, the autobiography of a yogi inspires you to seek God and his commentary, Master's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita tells you how to go about seeking God, tells you how to do it. So let us remember, just as we celebrate the Masters, that we're really also in a way celebrating our own parents, our own mothers and fathers. In other words, they're not just figures, but uh, souls who have a specific interest in us. And they want to help us, they've come to help us, and they are actively continuing to help us. And let us cooperate with their efforts to help us. Let's take the prescriptions and follow them. Let's, again, be inspired by, by their example to say, if they can do it, 
I will try, and in time I will do it. It's the destiny of every soul. We really have no choice. It just can take a lesser amount of time or a longer amount of time. And really, I think it has already taken long enough that our heart's desire for that perfection, that peace, that calmness. As one Christian saint put it, as speaking to God, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And don't worry about what other people think and what other people say and whether they agree or not. Whenever you find someone who's interested in a discussion, it's wonderful. But if someone is, it, in their only version of discussion is to try to shove their beliefs down your own throat, then just, you know, give them some tea or something and some murka and just, you know, be comfortable. Because our opinions of truth do not change truth. And as much as, for example, someone else is trying to confine the truth in a very limited way and say that only is truth, well, for one thing, we can view it with compassion because we may have viewed things that way once before, it earlier in our lives or in earlier incarnations. And we have to accept that even in this life, though we may have a broader vision of truth, it certainly is still limited until we become that truth. And that's what we're trying to do. So uh, as one uh, great uh, Sufi mystic wrote, he wrote, a, his name is Hafiz, he wrote a poem, the small man builds cages for everyone he knows, while the saint who has to duck his head when the moon is low, keeps dropping keys all night long for the beautiful, rowdy prisoners. The saints come, as great and as tall as they are, they come to drop us keys uh, to get out of these cages that we have actually built for ourselves also. They're trying to help us out. I'd like to close with a reading from uh, Swami Kriyanandaji's writings on... Uh, this first reading is from the Bhagavad Gita, Essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Master's Commentary on the Gita, expressed by Swamiji. Mahavatar Babaji announced to his disciple, Lahiri Mahashaya, that he himself was Krishna in a former earth incarnation. My guru told me that Lahiri Mahashaya was Raja Janaka of, Rama, of Ramayana fame. Paramhansa Yogananda said that he himself was Arjuna, to whom Krishna in that life delivered this most famous of all discourses, the Bhagavad Gita. And from the New Path by Swami Kriyananda. Spiritual awakenings takes place when all one's energy flows upward toward the spiritual eye. Numerous yoga techniques have, for their main objective, the awakening of this energy flow. Of all such yoga techniques, so taught Paramhansa Yogananda and his line of gurus, the most effective, because the most central and direct in its application, is Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga involves deliberately directing a flow of energy through the spine, thereby realigning in a single south-north direction every molecule or tendency. The Kriya technique, so our line of gurus said, was the one taught to Arjuna in ancient times by Krishna. And Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita states that he bestowed this technique on humanity in an incarnation long prior to the one in which he taught Arjuna. Of all the techniques of yoga, Kriya is not only the most ancient, but the most central and essential. Kriya Yoga directs energy lengthwise around the spine, gradually neutralizing there the eddies of chitta. At the same time, it strengthens the nerves in the spine and brain to receive cosmic currents of energy and consciousness. Yogananda called Kriya the supreme science of yoga. Beside it, all other yoga techniques, most of which work on calming the breath and concentrating the mind, though important in themselves, Yogananda also taught a number of them, must be classed as subsidiary. 
I wasn't sent by Christ and the great masters of India, Yogananda often told his audiences, to dogmatize you with a new theology. Jesus himself asked Babaji to send someone to teach you the science of Kriya Yoga, that people might learn how to commune with God directly. I want to help you toward the attainment of actual experience of him through your daily practice of Kriya Yoga. He added, the time for knowing God has come. And also from the new path, a lovely story from Swamiji. I too have experienced Babaji's blessings on occasions when I have prayed to him. In 1960, on my second visit to India, I wanted to find a place of seclusion for a few days before returning to Calcutta to resume my activities in our society there. I had no idea where to go, however. Part of my difficulty was that Indians often found a Western Swami a novelty. Villagers especially would sometimes gather in scores outside any house I stayed at. They waited for hours, if need be, for me to come out. I was staying in a hotel in Madras at this time, having entered India from Ceylon to the south. One morning I prayed to Babaji, please help me to find a quiet, secluded place to stay in. After meditation that morning, I went down and ate breakfast in the hotel dining room. A man seated at the table next to mine introduced himself to me. I have a house, he informed me without any preliminaries, in a secluded section of a little, in the little town of Kodai Canal. I would be honored if you would use it for meditation. I shall be away from there for the next few weeks. No one will bother you. It occurred to me that since Kodai Canal is in the mountains, its cool climate might be congenial to you. Westerners often go there to escape the heat of the plains. I took advantage of his offer. The place proved ideal in every respect. 